Hello fellow explorers, today we are diving deep into the heart of history. Together, let's explore the hidden gem, Jumba la Mtwana in Mtwapa, Kenya. But before you unveil its ancient secrets, let me paint a vivid picture for you. Jumba la Mtwana in Swahili translates to the large house of slaves. This is a captivating archaeological site that echoes tales of Swahili culture, trade and centuries gone by. Jumba la Mtwana was gazetted as a Kenyan national monument on 4th June 1982 under Kenyan Gazette Notice 1515, making it a historical site. This was once a town that has now turned into ancient ruins with three majestic mosques, a tomb, a social hall, a courthouse, and four legendary houses, including the house of the cylinder, the house of the kitchen, the house of many doors, and how about you stay tuned to find out of the other house. Before we unlock the secrets of this masterpiece, we have to pay the entrance fees to access the monument. Here are the entrance prices. We paid a top up of 50 Kenya shillings as convenience fees for using the e-citizen platform to make payment. Just by the reception is a museum full of riches of the Swahili culture, its history and its ways. This is our first stage to unlocking the forgotten secrets of centuries past from how the old towns started and how they were designed to how they have developed over the years and the materials used in building the towns. The early Swahili towns date to over 2000 years ago where the Swahilis lived in temporary structures. In the 10th century, the Swahili started developing semi-permanent structures before acquiring the skill to develop permanent modern old towns like the one in Mombasa in the 13th century. The architecture used in creating these ancient towns was simply mind-blowing. Structures were purely made out of coral rock blocks and held together by lime mortar made out of the coral rocks. The roofs of many mosques and tombs during this period were domed, including the Chaka Mosque in the Chaka Ruins and the preserved Congo Mosque in the south coast of Kenya. When building, beams of mangrove poles were used to support the roofs. The walls and floors were finished in lime plaster while some roofs were still made from palm touch. The museum has a lot of information of the old architecture where houses were built without using any metal. The beautifully carved doors symbolize the wealth of the owners. Pictures of the first government post office, now the Lamu Museum, pictures of the Mambri town, pictures of Lamu Islands and more are all preserved in the museum. The inhabitants of this town were mainly the Swahili, who are an urbanized African Bantu speaking people unified by the Islamic religion. Here, we found out that the Buibui was introduced to the Swahili in 1920. Before that, this is how the Swahili women used to dress. In the museum, there are cultural artifacts, boat making tools, preserved corals, and other materials excavated from the ruins. Outside the museum, Liza reconstructed skeletons palm with was ashore in 2013. Walking through these ancient ruins is like stepping into a time machine and learning about a people who once called this their home. After 100 years of occupation, the previous inhabitants left this town in 1450. It is not clear why, but it is believed that an outbreak of diseases, civil wars, and battery led to the exodus. While living here, the inhabitants relied on trees and nature to get food, wood to make boats, and medicine. While exploring, we came across the house of cylinders, a bathing haven where one would sit on the cylindrical rocks and take a bath. Here, used water would enter the tub near the wall and go to the septic tank. The house of cylinder also had changing rooms where people would change after bathing. Just outside the house of cylinders is a latrine, and beside it is a 700-year-old fresh water borehole which to date still supplies water. Next to this borehole is a three-bedroom house. A mosque is also located just after this house. Now, imagine sitting in the house of kitchen, where the aroma of spices once filled the air. This is where the community's food was prepared. From this kitchen, food was placed in the dining area where the leader, popularly known as Mtwana, would eat with his guests. Just by the house of kitchen was the house of many dolls, which symbolized a statement of wealth and power 
with each door leading to different rooms for different purposes. The leader's house was designed as an inward-looking, self-contained complex organized around a central courtyard. Its first room was used to receive visitors. The innermost rooms were used as master bedrooms and women's quarters. Here is where the leader slept. Jumbalamtwana's house also had bedrooms situated on its outside to host other visitors and guards. In this town, which measured over 10 acres, lay a court of law which dealt with cases and appeals. Most cases handled here included those of theft and infidelity. Justice was served with a strong hand. Anyone found stealing would have their hand chopped off. Anyone found sleeping with someone's spouse would be stoned to death. Other crimes would be punishable by hundred stocks of cane. Once punishment had been served, the case was dismissed. Near the court lay a social hall where social engagements were held. Imagine going around a baobab tree seven times and having your wishes granted. It is believed that this baobab once had magical powers which it has since lost. Materials from this baobab tree were used to create baskets, prepare baobab fruits and make crops. This opening space is the town area where people would meet and relax before taking prayers in the central mosque. Just like the other mosque, a bohol was dug close to the mosque for the purposes of ablution before prayers were carried out. Men and women had separate areas to wash themselves. Men on the outside, while women's area was in the inside of the mosque. This was the second largest mosque, popularly known as the central mosque, as it was between the two mosques. The third mosque is by the beach. Mosques were built from the same material as the houses, but had pillars and columns to support the roofs. All Muslim faithful faced the mirab, popularly referred to as Mecca, when praying. I have to say that setting foot in Jumbalamtwana has been a much needed experience. We have learned a lot about the Swahili culture and uncovered stories of centuries past. The stones here have a lot of history. It's a connection to our roots and our shared human story. Venturing into the tombs is a bit strange but fascinating. The craftsmanship in these final resting places is a testament to the respect the Swahili people had for their departed. This is a mix of mystery and reverence. It is said that the leaders were the ones buried in these tombs. And of course, we can't miss the beach. In the past, traders docked their doors here to trade. A vibrant market existed by the beach where slave trading and item trading will take place while the laughter would echo through the salty breeze. This beach is like a living museum of its own. On the current day, it is just a normal beautiful white sandy mtopa beach, beautiful to the mind, eyes, body and spirit. If you have been captivated by this journey as we have, don't forget to hit that like, share, notification bell, subscribe button and turn on the notifications. Kindly support our channel by joining our community of explorers for more thrilling vlogs. And if you have ever visited Jumbalamtwana or any other historical site, kindly share your experiences in the comment section below so we can relive the experience together in upcoming vlogs. Before you go, check out our playlist for more exciting videos like this one. Until next time, keep exploring, keep learning, and keep making memories. See you on the next adventure and thanks for watching.